Hey guys, y'all know the drill. Somebody give me a yes or a thumbs up or anything if you can hear me and I'm coming through. Excellent. Thank you, Max. Very good, Douglas. Um, so let me think. Is there any old orders of business or new stuff to tell y'all about? Um, I can't think of anything off the top of my head. Just thinking if there's anything before we just jump into talking about what we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, and the only thing I can think of off the top of my head is I have two more tournaments this month. I'm going to be competing in a tournament in um, here in Louisiana on the 19th and w another one in Texas on, I believe it's the 26th. Uh, and the categories that I will be competing in are sparring, um, board breaking, and traditional forms, or kata, as they call them in Japanese karate. Uh, yeah. But that's the only thing I can think of off the top of my head. I'll keep y'all posted how those goes, how they go. So far, I have not been able to break uh, third place in anything. I've done two tournaments, um, and in both of those, I managed to snag uh, third place in two different categories. Thank you, John. Thank you. Uh, that's why I was actually um, bringing it up is because those of y'all on in the Magnum Opus groups know that I uh, would very much appreciate um, any magic or energy you want to sling my way for those tournaments. You know, that's that's a huge part of what I do. Like, you know, people think of, of magic as like this big, you know, like like thing they only break out like every once in a while for some big occasion or, you know, like, like you always hear about in Christianity, what they call uh, like Sunday Christians who the only time they ever pray is on Sunday, whenever they go in to, to church. Um, but we're supposed to be doing magic or praying or whatever you want to call it. However you want to phrase it. Technically it's all the same thing. You know, I know there are some people who would get outraged and say it's sacrilegious that I'm saying that, but it's true. I mean, all you're doing is addressing divinity and focusing energy and intention, no matter which one you're doing. Um, but yes, Jenny, magic slinging, sling some magic my way. Yes. Uh, but that's why I bring it up because I will appreciate any that y'all want to send my way. But that's another thing that I do is I try, you know, I can't do magic for every tiny little thing in my life. There's just too much. But I do try to do magic with with the intention of making everything that I possibly can in my life go as smoothly as it can and for the the you know so that I get the maximum amount of growth and potential and everything else out of it. And it could be anything from you know competing in these tournaments to like I if I know I have to go to dinner with someone one night, I'll, you know, bless that before I ever even get there so that it goes as well as possible. Like everything we're supposed to be doing magic for everything as much as we possibly can. If you start doing that, you know, it's one of the things I brought this up a million times. Like Jesus says, um, pray unceasingly in the Bible. Aleister Crowley said, inflame thyself with prayer. The more you can integrate your everyday life with your magic life, the faster you're going to see results in yourself, the, the quicker you're going to make progress along this path. And what I mean by progress, you know, once again, I don't mean lusting after some kind of results. I just mean the kind of growth and development that you're going to witness in yourself. You know, like I, we talk all the time in Magnum Opus about like people talk about how like even in just the past month since we talked the last time, I feel like I'm a different person. And, you know, I always bring up how there are times like during really, really intense times of practice when I've looked back over a period of like two weeks and could not believe how much I had changed even in two weeks. If you inflame yourself with prayer, 
if you pray unceasingly, if you do magic for for as many things in your life as you possibly can, just to bless those things. Think of it as all you're doing is blessing them. And you can do it in a million different ways. You can do a pentagram invoking ritual and direct the energy towards whatever it is. You can do the analysis of the keyword or what I always call the LVX ritual and bring the light down on the situation or person or circumstance, whatever it is. You can do the middle pillar and then inhale and collapse all of that energy into your Tiferet center push it out through your hands and into whatever it is. There's a million different ways of doing it. And the more you bring this, you know, I mean, that's what magic is. Magic is the union of opposites. That's what they call it. That, you know, they say that that's what we're aiming at. That's what we're trying to move towards. We're uniting opposites. Well, we tend to view our spiritual life and our earthly life or our mundane life, whatever you want to call it as, as, two different things, you know, like different ends of the spectrum. And a lot of people will say like, this doesn't matter. You hear people a lot in spiritual circles that have this kind of misconception. They'll say, oh, well, nothing out here matters anyway. This world is just illusion. You know, that, that, that isn't really technically correct to say that nothing out here matters. What I mean by that is, you know, I've said this a million times, brought this up a million times, talked about how when we say God created the world in magic, we don't mean the same thing or we don't mean it in the same way that they usually use it in religious circles. Like in religious circles, they look at it like an artist who creates a painting or a sculpture or what have you. And at the end of the process, the artist is still here and the piece they've created is over there. They're two separate things. They view God creating the world like that, like God is somewhere off in space or up in the clouds and it created the world and set it in motion and then stepped away. Let it, let it spin on its own. In magic, what we're talking about when we say God created the world, first off, God is shorthand for this infinite source of consciousness and energy. When we say God created the world, what we mean is that infinite source of consciousness and energy began to pour itself into the dimensions of time and space. When it did that, it became the world. It became us. We are God. Every person you meet is God. Everything that exists in this world is God. This is what God concerns itself with. You know, even when you reach the highest, you know, when you're when you're doing all these different magical rituals, when you're doing the elemental work and the planetary work and the zodiacal work, what you're doing is kind of ascending a ladder. You're trying to reach the mind, what Dante called the Empyrean, the mind of God. Well, when you reach the mind of God, what happens is you find yourself back here in this world. It's like you see the light, you know, like in those cheesy psychic shows, you see the, where they always say, go into the light, go into the light, talking to dead people. Well, if you go into that light, you get spit back out into this world. Same way with magic. When you enter that light, when your consciousness goes into that light, you get spit back out into this world. And at first you're like, wow, what was that? What, you know, why is that the case? Why did that happen? You know, all of that, like like going through all of these months and months of work or years in some cases of work and finally reaching this destination that I could always see ahead of me and finally reaching it. And when I reach it, I'm back here. Like, what does this mean? It means that this, everything around us and you is at the center of the mind of God. This is what God is concerned with. This is what God chose to do with itself. It chose to become this. Everything around us, including us, it chose to do this with itself, with its time, with its energy. Who are we to say that what the source of creation chose to do doesn't matter? It matters very, very much. This is, you know, like that Zen saying, before enlightenment, I chopped wood and carried water. After enlightenment, I chopped wood and carried water. 
but there's a whole voyage that takes place, a whole journey that takes place in between those two things. But when you reach towards, when you get to the end of that journey, that's when you realize the stuff that you were doing in the very beginning of your life is the stuff that still matters. Taking care of your family, taking care of yourself. And all of this, it might sound like I'm rambling right now, but all of this ties into the next lesson in high magic, like what we're getting, what we're getting at. Give me one second. I'm going to read y'all's questions real quick and just see if there's anything that I need to answer. Yeah, Time Travel Kitty says, I feel like I'm hitting a new plateau every other week, trying to figure out if that's a good thing from much growth or what. If you keep pushing really hard in your practice, you will continue to constantly grow, constantly expand. Even if you're just doing the basic rituals, you don't have to be pushing yourself to do new rituals every week. All you need to do are the same basic rituals and even doing those, it's just like, you know, doing, doing any kind of exercise. If you consistently keep hitting those exercises, pushing yourself a little bit, you know, putting as much of yourself into it as you can, you're going to continue to experience physical development. Same way with doing magic. You're going to continue to experience development on, on every level of your being. You know, I almost said spiritual development, but it's, it's development on every level of our being. And that ties into also the next lesson. But give me one second. I'm reading y'all stuff first. Yeah. Lisa says it also keeps you present and engaged in your life. Yes. And that is very, very important more important than most people realize, you know, there's a saying in martial arts that how you do one thing is how you will do everything. Whenever you're learning certain forms, like you're supposed to pay complete and absolute attention to it and, and strive to perform these forms with as much excellence as you possibly can. Don't do them half-heartedly. Don't do them sloppily. Don't do them just to get through them. You be present with every movement of your body. You know, you you try to feel, and, and a lot of it is about energy techniques, you know, feeling energy shift from, from one side of your body to the other. You know, one of the ways it was described to me, like what, what my teacher was saying was how you should visualize your body kind of filled with water. And every time you take a step towards one direction, you kind of feel the water move towards that side. And every time you move towards the other direction, you feel the water kind of move to that side. Well, what happens when you're visualizing that and you keep doing these movements, you'll start to feel something moving from one side to the other. Well, it's not actually water. What it is, is, is energy. It's chi. Like the more you focus your concentration internally and try to feel and control this shifting of chi from side to side, the more you're going to start to, to actually feel it. But what happens whenever you're doing this stuff is if you do them to the bet with, with as much excellence as you possibly can to the best of your ability, you are gradually going to find not all the time, not 100% of the time, not in every way on every day, but you're going to find that spirit of excellence starts to leak over into other aspects of your life. You know, you, you'll find yourself applying that kind of focus and concentration and excellence to every other aspect of your life, like cleaning your house. You know, you're not going to be content to live in a cluttered, uh, garbagey environment anymore. You can't. If you're changing then your environment's going to change because as within, so without. Every, the, the more excellence you bring to one thing, the more it's eventually going to leak into other things. And that, once again, ties into what we're going to be talking about tonight. One second, one second. Yeah, Time Travel Kitty says, I like to think pain is growth, but I don't know. Well, Pain is a sign of growth. What pain tells you 
is that you are stepping outside of your comfort zone. You know, th- like like when you're stretching, you know, like if you've ever done a yoga class or if you've ever had to stretch, they say if a stretch don't hurt, a stretch don't work. If you're reaching beyond where you reached yesterday, doing something, you know, reaching, say you're bending over to touch your toes and you reach a little further down today than you did yesterday, it's going to hurt. Well, that means that it's working. The pain is a symptom of your progress. So when we feel pain, mental pain, emotional pain, physical pain, what it tells us is that we are um, stepping outside of our comfort zones and pushing ourselves a little further than we did last time. Even when you're doing something like lifting weights, you know, a lot of people lift, a lot of people count reps as they're lifting, you know, like they'll, they'll focus on doing 20 reps. Those reps really are not doing anything until they start hurting. The ones you do in the beginning they're not, they're not making your muscles grow. Your muscles are growing when they are burning and hurting. Or actually they're being broken down, but that the breaking them down is what makes them, you know, repair themselves and come back bigger and stronger. The entire point of magic is just to experience union with divinity. Well, if that were true, If that was the entire purpose and meaning of everything, if that was the only purpose and meaning of everything, experiencing the union with divinity, you would have never came here because you were united with divinity before you incarnated in the physical world. You were already doing that. You separated yourself from that union in order to come here and do something. That is exactly right. If nothing in this world mattered, then you would have never come here in the first place. Exactly, Sarah. All right, give me one second. Just reading through y'all's comments. Yeah, Hadrian Hadrian Blackthorn says, weight training helped me with the basics of energy work before I ever got to magic just because of the mind-muscle connection they always talk about. Yes, 100%. 100%. Okay, so I think that's all the comments and questions. Um, so this one, Hayden is asking another question um, that I've answered before several times, but I'm going to answer it one more time just in case there are new people that haven't heard this before uh, and you don't have to go back and dig through a bunch of videos. You know, I can't even remember how long ago it was we talked about this. Um, Probably in the first, you know, this is like lesson 10, I think, in High Magic. I'm trying to go back. I started at one and I'm trying to make everything as simple and concise and all in one place uh, as I possibly can. So one thing I would highly recommend is going back through the archives and start at lesson one, which would be, you know, less than 10 weeks ago. Start there. I may have covered this in even even there, like in those last videos, but I'm going to go through this one more time real quick. Um, So Hayden is asking in the Lester ritual, the hexagram, why do the fire hexagram in the east, the earth hexagram in the south? Wait. Yeah. Why why do we do the fire hexagram in the east, the earth hexagram in the south, um, air in the west and, and water in the north? People get, you know, people who are just starting to practice magic get confused about that all the time. Like, I've been asked that question a million times, and I've even heard people, some people say, I don't think this is right. You know, if it it doesn't match the lesser pentagram ritual, like in in the lesser pentagram ritual, east is air and south is fire and west is water and north is earth. So why do these things get switched up? in the lesser uh, hexagram ritual. And these these directions don't correspond to those elements anymore. And it's because they represent two completely different things. When you're doing the lesser pentagram ritual, what you're doing is moving through the cycle of the day or the cycle of the year 
as the sun experiences the energy of the sun, or as the earth experiences the energy of the sun. When you're doing the lesser pentagram ritual, it's almost as if you are the earth and you are experiencing the sun the way the earth does. You know, you, you start off with east is spring and east is morning. Spring is the first, uh, what do you call them? Season, season that, the, that starts, yes, triplicity is Mary. Uh, the first thing that happens, the way the earth experiences the sun is with sunrise, with the morning. So that's why I'm, east represents sunrise and spring. Spring is the first season. Second, after, after sunrise, what do we experience? The next stage of the sun would be high noon. You know, when the sun is at its peak, that's what the south is. Well, what's the season that comes after spring? Summer. So that's why the south represents also summer. West represents what's the next way we experience the sun? Sun going down, sun setting. That's west. Next thing we experience is night. That's north. Well, when we're ex when we're doing the lesser hexagram ritual, what we are doing is not identifying with the earth anymore. In the lesser pentagram ritual, we are the earth experiencing the cycles of the sun. In the lesser hexagram ritual, we are the sun. And this ties into how we're trying to change consciousness in magic. Most people operate from what we call a terrestrial state of consciousness, meaning they're still very, very much intertwined with the earth and its cycles and all the comings and goings and doings going on here. What we're trying to work up to is eventually stellar consciousness, but in between there's solar consciousness, what some people call Christ consciousness. Christ consciousness is when we no longer identify as the earth, but we identify as the sun. So the reason the first sign of the reason in the, in the East we're drawing, see, this is what I mean. I can't even hardly describe this stuff anymore. I'm losing the ability to even talk about these basic tenets. Um, something is happening to me. I've, I've been noticing it for probably the past six months. Y'all know how when I got out of prison, I started to forget everything. But the only thing I never forgot was magic. Now, I'm, I'm losing the ability to even articulate that. Because it, it's not... What happens eventually, and this is a very, very long way off... Don't think I mean now. Don't, you know, a lot of people will say I'm developing my own system of magic. Well, they're not in a position to be able to do that yet because they don't even understand like what all the underlying mechanics and the theories and the philosophies and, and the symbolism and all of that kind of stuff is. So they're not in a position. What they're doing is just, you know, randomly making stuff up. But when you reach a certain point, you know, when you reach what they call the third order in magic, it says that you can, you, you'll basically create your own system where you'll keep doing this work, but it won't be in ways that are described in books. It won't be in ways created by other people anymore. And that's kind of what has happened to me. I've figured out new ways of doing this work that don't look like what most people who are interested in magic are going to think of them as looking like. People who only see magic as like the Golden Dawn system, you know, pentagrams and hexagrams and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. It doesn't look like that for me anymore. It's, it's a much different thing. So all of that previous stuff, my ability to articulate it, 
is fading rapidly now. But my point is um, when you do the lesser hexagram ritual, you're experiencing it as if you are the sun moving through the constellations of the zodiac. So what's the first sign of the zodiac? Aries. What kind of sign is Aries? It's a fire sign. Therefore, the east represents fire in the hexagram ritual. What you're doing, when, the reason that the elements are in the order they are in the hexagram ritual is because that is the order of the constellations of the zodiac. I'm trying to remember off the top of my head. So I know the first is fire. What's the second? Earth, is it? I get them mixed up now. But that's the order of... That's the thing, Max. Max says maybe you should start focusing more on teaching your versions and not the traditional ones. That's the thing is you have to go through all the traditional ones first. You know, these are, th this is how you learn to do the other stuff. If, if you don't integrate these completely and absolutely into your being, then the other, other stuff won't really work. Anyway. I hope that, I hope that made sense, Hayden. I hope I described that. No, we're not talking about the four fixed signs of the zodiac. We're talking that you're talking about the supreme pentagram ritual when you're talking about that. What we're talking about is the first four signs of the zodiac. I remember the first is Aries and it's fire. I think the second one is is it Earth? Somebody will have to find that. Angie, thank you, Angie. Thank God. Yes, thank you, Angie. So Angie says. The first is Aries and it's fire. The second is Taurus and it's earth. The third is Gemini and it's air. And the fourth is cancer and it's water. Those are the first four signs of the Zodiac that the sun goes through as it travels throughout the course of the year. Thank you guys. Yes, I see a lot of y'all have been paying attention. Excellent. See, now y'all are going to have to start teaching me stuff because I can't even remember it anymore. That is perfect. Excellent. Y'all are great. Um, but that, that's, that's the difference. The difference is the pentagram ritual is the way the earth experiences the sun. The hexagram ritual is the way the sun travels through the constellations of the zodiac. When you do the pentagram ritual, you are identifying as the earth because that's the level of consciousness that most people, well, pretty much everybody is going to be operating from when they first start magic. They're going to be operating from a terrestrial consciousness. So what you're doing is purifying and refining that, that kind of consciousness. What You're moving your way up gradually to solar consciousness and then even beyond that into stellar consciousness, which you're not going to find a lot of people talking about Um Honestly, I don't think most people in magic even know about it. Just because, you know, honestly, it's just not necessary to even talk about it most of the time because you have to get to solar consciousness first. And most people, it's going to take them a long time to even reach that. Um, <laughs> Sarah says you were just testing us. Yeah, that was it. Um. So what I want to talk about tonight was the next lesson, meaning what, where you go from what we've already talked about. So what we've already talked about, what we've already covered is what I believe Gannicus gave it this name, uh, the neophyte battery. I think that's what Gannicus was calling it. I believe it was Gannicus, but I think that's a, a very apt description of the rituals that we've been going over, the neophyte battery.
meaning the lesser pentagram ritual in both its banishing and invoking forms, the lesser hexagram ritual in its banishing and invoking forms, the middle pillar, uh, and the rose cross. Those are the four rituals that in the beginning, after you learn those, you are supposed to practice those over and over and over every single day. They will have radical, dramatic effects on your consciousness and on your life. Well, the next phase after those, what, and, and here's the thing, when you do this level of work, the next level of work, what you're supposed to be doing is delving into each of the four elements, kind of the way we've been doing in Magnum Opus. We started with earth, then we're going into air. We, we did air this month, started air, or last month in July, we started air. We're going into the second month of working with air uh, in August. We'll do the third month of working with air in September, but we're working our way through the elements. Now, whenever you do this, you're not going to experience any of these giant radical changes of consciousness that everybody talks about now that that's become so kind of popular since magic blew up in the past couple of years. I never in my life thought magic would become as popular as it is now. You know, people talking about these concepts like crossing the abyss and attaining the knowledge and conversation of the Holy guardian angel and all that. I never in a million years thought that this stuff would blow up the way it did in the past couple of years. So you hear people talking about that kind of stuff now. And yes, those are very, very big, important aspects. But the thing is, the reason most people aren't experiencing those kinds of things, even though they're talking about them and reading about them and watching videos about them and all that sort of thing, Part of the reason that most people aren't experiencing them is because they they haven't built a foundation yet, a strong foundation. What I mean by that is the next phase of what you're supposed to be doing is delving into each element. If you do this correctly, you will not be one of these people that you see out there that's a master of magic, but their whole life is in a shambles. Uh, you know, nothing in their world is in order in any way, shape, form or fashion. Like they're living in their mom's basement, uh, trying to dress creepy, um, you know, may as well be wearing a sandwich board around their neck that says, I'm an occultist, uh, all that kind of stuff. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Y'all seen it. We've all seen it. In magic, if you've been around magic very long at all, you've seen it. It's like, you know, these these you know, these people that that say like I'm an adept or I'm a master or whatever it is, but don't have any fruit to show for it. It's because they haven't they haven't built the foundation that you have to build in order to, to get to those higher states. What I mean by building the foundation is the first thing. So, you know, keep it. <laughs> Sarah says that sounds like a great Halloween costume. Um, keep in mind those rituals that we just talked about, the neophyte battery, um, yeah, Time Travel Kitty says seen it probably played the part. You know what? I I can't I can't trash talk people because, you know, I've I've done the same. You know, walking around looking gothy when I was a teenager, you know, um basically doing the same thing, you know, looking in a way that yeah, that's it. That's what I'm looking for. Astral Blur says edgy wickens. Exactly. And I fell into that category myself. Uh, you know, I th I think a lot of people who um, come to magic have to pass through that stage, have to pass through that phase. You know, and I make fun of it now because I was one of them. I was, as the kids say now, cringe. 
Yes, yes. Here, so Gannica says, I see people that get passed along in orders that still have major issues and never integrated the core lessons of neophyte and elemental grades. Yes, exactly. So, so the next phase of what you're going to be doing, keep in mind those rituals, you don't rush through this. Do not, do not rush through this. When you're doing those rituals, the lesser pentagram, the lesser hexagram, the middle pillar and the rose cross, once you get those down and you're doing those, you should do those every single day, at least twice a day, every single day for at least three months, at least three months. Do those every single day. Do them in the morning and do them in the evening. Or if you don't have time to split them up like that, you do them back to back. You know, you can go through the whole thing. You can do the pentagram ritual, the hexagram ritual, uh, the rose cross, the middle pillar. And then when you're done, start all over and do it again immediately. As a matter of fact, I've done that before like three times back to back to back. However you've got to cram it in your day, do it. You know, it's like that saying about how if if you if there's something you're passionate about and you practice it for at least 18 minutes a day, you are going to be better than 95 percent of the people who are into whatever it is, whether it's magic, whether it's martial arts, whether it's ballet, whether it's swimming, whether it's, you know, a particular subject that you're interested in and you spend 18, 20 minutes a day reading about it, whatever it is, if you spend just that short amount of time, you're going to be far ahead of, of most people who are into that. Same way with this stuff. Let me see what y'all are talking about. Give me one second. Yeah, yeah, John, yes, John, that is a very good John John McFaddy says, if it's something your ego can attach onto if you're not careful, because you can feel better than people who are not practicing. Yep. Yes. And the thing is, most people aren't supposed to be practicing this. You know, it's like everything is not for everybody. We're not all supposed to be Christians. We're not all supposed to be Muslims. We're not all supposed to be Jewish. We're not all supposed to be practicing magic. Everybody is here to follow their own path, and they have to be left alone to do it. It's not up to us to say who is or who isn't making fast enough progress. That's completely on them. Uh, one second, one second. Yep. Jessica Hughes says, that's why they say, if you want to write, you just got to do it every day for some amount of time. Absolutely. You sit down with a pen and a paper and you write, even when you feel like there's nothing there, you sit down and you write anyway. You write what you write about how you don't have anything to write about. If you do that, you will consistently get better at it. Yes. Yep. Yep. Here's another thing. Viticus says it takes 45 minutes for me to do all that minus the Rose Cross. Yeah. And there, there are no shortcuts. You don't have to do all of them. Bare minimum, I would say do the middle pillar and the lesser pentagram ritual, either invoking lesser pentagram or banishing lesser pentagram and the middle pillar. If that's all you've got time for, then that's all you've got time for. You know, some people have four kids. Some people are working two jobs. Some people are, you know, trying to get their college degree and studying for hours and hours a day. Everyone doesn't have, you know, all the time in the world to dedicate to magic. I did because I was in prison. You know, I'm sitting in a cell. What else did I have to do? So once again, don't don't judge yourself by my standards either. If you only have 15 minutes a day to do it, of course, you're going to move at a slower pace. You're not going to experience things. You're not going to, to pass through stuff as quickly as someone who's doing it for eight hours a day. But you're still going to be moving. And don't don't compare yourself to people who are doing eight hours a day. Don't compare yourself to anyone, period. 
just just keep your mind focused. Stay on your practice. If 15 minutes is all you got, 15 minutes is all you got. Don't sweat it. Just do your 15 minutes. That's it. Um, let me see. One second. That's the thing. Vitica says hard to get quiet time to do it. Sometimes you have to make it. You know, that's one of the reasons I recommend that book, with John Michael, I mean, Donald Michael Craig's book, Modern Magic, over and over. He says, don't wait until situation or circumstances are absolutely perfect before you start doing this work. If you have to go in your bathroom and lock yourself in the bathroom uh, for 15 minutes a day, do that. Go do it in your bathroom. Lock yourself in your bathroom for 15 minutes and do it. Nobody's going to mess with you. You know, they're going to think you're taking a shower or shaving or God knows what in there. 15 minutes in the bathroom, whatever. You know, it's yeah, it may seem a little weird, but you do what you got to do. So Hadrian says, started doing the middle pillar at work all the time. I've gotten used to doing the whole thing while moving around. That's another step in the process. You want to do it all the time. Yes. So Lila says, one of the things you said the other night at Magnum Opus was super helpful and might be helpful to others. Try doing it in all situations, like with your eyes opening in line. That was that was one of the things that really, really like poured gasoline um, on on my own development was whenever I started to do this stuff, not just in the short period of time that, you know, you set aside for your ritual work every day. But when you're standing in line at the grocery store waiting to check out, this is what Lyle was talking about that I was telling him the other night, um, you know, get used to doing the middle pillar with your eyes open. Get used to doing it while you're in line at the grocery store. This doesn't mean you have to bellow out like vibrating the divine names in the middle of Kroger or whatever, but at least stand there. And while you're waiting, focus on each of the spheres, you know, focus on Kether and just inhale a few times and see it getting brighter and brighter and brighter. Focus on Da'oth, inhale a few times, seeing it getting brighter and brighter and brighter. Focus on Tipperath, inhale a few times, seeing it getting brighter and brighter and brighter. Go all the way down while you're standing in line at the grocery store. Or if you go to a coffee place, you know, go get a cup of coffee, sit there having your coffee. And while you're having your coffee, nobody's going to know you're doing magic. <laughs> John McFaddy says, excuse me, sir, do you want any cash back? Adonai. Yes. No need to go crazy. Um, but when you're sitting there having a cup of coffee, do it while you're drinking your cup of coffee in the coffee shop. You're just sitting there. Nobody's going to know you're doing magic. You're just going to be drinking your drink while you're doing it. You're sitting there focusing on your Kether Center, inhaling, seeing it get brighter and brighter and brighter. No one has to know you're doing this stuff. You sneak it in everywhere you get the chance to sneak it in. I used to do it in church all the time. Like when I went to church, what do you got to do besides sit there? I sit there in church. Focusing on my energy centers, breathing and seeing them getting brighter and brighter and brighter. Yeah, that's another thing. Ganica says most people aren't paying attention. 100% true. Somebody said one time, they said when you're in your uh, 20s and 30s, you worry about what people think about you. And then when you're in your 40s, you stop caring what people think about you. And then when you get into your 50s, you realize most people were never thinking about you in the first place. 100%. Most people are not paying attention to you because they don't care about you. They are very, very terrestrial consciousness oriented. They are focusing on themselves, the dramas and whatnot in their own lives, you know, rethinking conversations they've had with people, whatever it is. Most people are paying no attention to you whatsoever. Yes, Billy says you can always charge your food and water. Exactly. Yep, that is exactly right, Viticus. Viticus says, could doing it physically in morning and mentally at night, the whole group of rituals be okay if you can't do twice a day physically? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. 100%. So what I mean, next step of the process, what we're getting to next step of the process is you're going to start invoking. um, Traditionally, you start with earth. Earth is the lowest element because it's, it's, it's the densest element because it's here. It's the physical world. It's stuff we can touch, taste, smell, see, hear. That's why we started with earth and magnum opus. You're going to start invoking earth every single day. What you're doing, all of these elements correspond to parts of us. Like earth corresponds or represents the physical material aspect of our existence, our bodies, our flesh and blood bodies, our financial situations, the houses we live in, anything in your material world corresponds to earth. So while you're invoking earth every day, now just by doing the invocations, if you invoke this energy every single day, the energy itself is going to kind of do the heavy lifting for you. Sometimes people without even knowing like what it's supposed to happen to them whenever they're invoking earth will find themselves doing the things that happen to you when you're invoking it without even knowing it. But sometimes you have to give it a little jump start, a little boost. So while you're, and, and this is this is also what keeps you becoming, keeps you from becoming one of the, the cringe, edgelord, magic people. You know, the ones who are like, you know, I'm a Magister Tim Ply, but I can't clean my own room. You know, this this is what keeps you from from falling into that is you actively work on whatever aspect of yourself it is that corresponds to the element that you're invoking. This is why in Magnum Opus, one of like some of the things that, that they were taking on and I've been doing the work right along with them. Like I decided when we started, when we started doing the magnum opus work, I decided I was going to put myself through the process again, because it's here's the thing. You don't just go through this stuff one time. It's like the alchemical process. The more you put something through an alchemical process, like ideally, if you're, if you're putting an herb through the alchemical process, you don't just do it one time. You do it seven times. Like after it's finished one time and you've got all like you boiled it all and it's evaporated and condensed and come back down the tube and dripped a drop at a time into your container. After you've done the entire thing, then you take what the liquid in your container and you pour it back into the distillation kit and you put it through again. And then you'll have even less when it comes through the second time, but then you pour it in again, do it a third time. Ideally you want to do that seven times to get, the substance that you're working with as pure, refined, and powerful as it can possibly be. Same way with yourself doing this stuff. There is no reason in the world why you can't come back and do this work over and over and over. And that's kind of what I've been doing whenever we started Magnum Opus. I decided I was going to do that, put myself through the work along with everybody else. So everything that that we're telling everybody else to do in Magnum Opus, I'm doing also. You know, like one of the things that we told people to do was take up some kind of physical activity to, to strengthen and develop your body. It could be martial arts. It could be gymnastics. It could be dance. It could be calisthenics. Uh, it could be, um, um, you know, just if, if nothing else, uh, going for a walk like Angie, I know Angie's been in a wheelchair and she started doing um, like water exercises because she can't, you know, get up and go for a run or, you know, any of that kind of stuff that a a lot of people take for granted. But she started doing physical rehabilitation in a pool, doing exercises in the water. However you got to do it. One of the things that we ask is apply yourself to doing something that is going to help strengthen you physically. That's going to improve your physical health. That's one of the ways that you don't fall into the trap of being a master whose whose life is crap. 
because you're going to be actively working on refining and improving every aspect of your existence. So there's, there's that like, and for me, uh, you know, one of the, that was when I started, uh, martial arts. That was when I started Tong Soo Do. I started doing it like, like a whim spur of the moment thing. I was already doing boxing. I figured, okay, what can I add to this? It's going to be complimentary to, you know, that practice already. Uh, and the answer I thought was, okay, martial arts. Well, let's do that. I started that. It ended up becoming like a huge love of my life. You know, it was something I'd always wanted to do since I was a child. Anyway, the two things that I was obsessed with when I was a child was magic and martial arts. Those were the, the only two things I thought about. You know, when I was a kid, I never thought when I grow up, I want to be a cop or I want to be a firefighter. Or I want to be a lawyer. or I want to be a doctor. I never thought of, of any of those things. I thought I want to do magic and I want to do karate. Crazy as that sounds, those were the two things I always wanted to do. I'm almost 50 years old. I realized if I don't get on this pretty soon, my life is going to be over without me ever having started this. So I started it. And I love it as much as I ever thought I would. But that's that was my exercise thing that I took on to, to work alongside everyone doing the magnum opus work. The other thing that we, oh, we asked them also, try to improve your diet. You know, most people don't realize how horrendously they eat. I used to eat very horrendously. You know, I used to eat cheeseburgers like every day, cheeseburgers and whiskey every day. But if you would ask me, I would have probably thought, well, I eat, you know, I don't eat as bad as some people. Um, yeah, yeah. Billy says, especially if you if you're in America. Mm hmm. Yeah. Um, but we, we ask them improve, try to improve your diet try to the best of your ability to start incorporating more fresh fruit, more fresh vegetables, more real meat. I'm not talking about like packs of, you know, bologna and salami, stuff like that. I'm talking about like, like pure grass fed, no hormones added steak. You know, if you eat meat, if you don't, that's fine too. But if, if you don't try to stay away from, from the garbage stuff that people usually replace meat with like those fake chicken wings or fake, um, corn dogs, you know, all that kind of stuff that, that is not, that's not good. Yeah. Yeah. Dejimin says my diet consists of microplastics and sugar. My, yes, Rodney says eggs are great. Eggs absolutely are great. Yes, they are. As long as you're not eating a lot of fried butter, you know, frying them in butter and all that kind of stuff. Uh, use like olive oil, spray olive oil in a pan, you know, even little things like that. Like when you're cooking something, don't cook it in butter. Don't cook it in lard. Cook it in something like olive oil. Like there's a million little bitty tiny things you can do like that. Just things you can um yeah, Ganica says, if it doesn't grow, it goes. Yes. You know, if you read the, the back of it um, and you see a bunch of, you know what, Rodney? Rodney says, I use ghee, which is purified butter. When I got really, really sick, here's the thing. I'm talking about how bad I used to eat. And it, it eventually made my entire digestive system collapse. I almost died. One of the things that brought me back, like I could only, and, and for three straight months, I could eat nothing but steamed white rice, no salt, no pepper, no butter, no sugar, nothing on it whatsoever. Just steamed white rice every day. After I ate that for three months, then I started being able to eat apples, apples that had been peeled and chopped up into little pieces and cooked in ghee cooked in ghee. That was one of the, the things that allowed my health to start recovering. 
Yeah, Billy, and Billy's exactly right. Billy says, after a while, your body will reject junk food if you keep it up. Eating McDonald's makes me so sick now. Yeah, and it's also like after you start um, eating healthier, and what you're what you're doing is eating chi. The number the, the two ways that we take in chi, there's only two ways that we can take in chi. One is through the food we eat, the other is through the air we breathe. The, the quality of the food you eat is determining the quality of the chi that you're taking in through that food. When you're eating apples and oranges and pears and, you know, kale and spinach and steak and all those kinds of things, you're taking in fresh chi. But when you're taking in something that you turn the ingredients around and read the back of it, like a pack of lunch meat or something like that, and you're reading, you know, phosphosodium glossomates or whatever the hell that stuff is, um, there's very little chi in that stuff. Very little processed food, they call it. And when you do start getting getting that getting a taste and you get used to taking in actual chi from food, life force energy, then that other stuff will make you feel like crap because you're changing your vibrational rate. You're not used to taking in garbage anymore. You're used to taking in life force. I do not know what drain gang is, spiritual path. I do not know. Yeah, Mary says bas basmati, which is rice, uh, milk, ghee, honey. It's sattvic, pure spiritual food. Um, for me, though, the, the only thing in that list you said is, is after my digestive system collapsed, I couldn't take milk anymore. Like now I use oat milk. Um, like, and I don't even use much of that. I don't really do a lot of dairy at all. I very, very rarely consume like cheese or any sort of thing like that. Uh, and my body just doesn't accept milk anymore. And the only time I use oat milk, even is if I drink like a cappuccino or something, I'll make it with oat milk instead of regular milk. Anyway, I don't want to belabor this stuff, you know, go over every little minute detail of your diet, micromanaging it and tell you and telling you how to eat and all that kind of stuff. I'm just saying this is the second way, like when we're doing the magnum opus work, this is the second way that we gave them to work on strengthening, refining and purifying the aspect of your existence that corresponds to the element of earth, which is your body. So while you're invoking earth every single day, you want to start exercising. You want to, to the best of your ability, start to improve your diet. This may mean even taking on, on study. You know, you might have to start studying like uh, supplements and nutrition and all the different things your body needs and all this kind of stuff. Like it's, it's a journey learning that kind of stuff. It is, it is 100% a journey. Um, Third thing, spend time in nature. You know, we just said that the two main ways you take in chi are through eating, or the, the only two ways you take in chi are through eating and breathing. Even when we do magic, what we're doing is using the chi that we take in when we're breathing. So you want to breathe in air that is as filled with um, as much rich, vital, life-giving chi as you possibly can, which means getting close to nature in a lot of cases. If you can be close to the ocean, that's one of the best things that you can do. Like you're getting like negatively charged ions. Come here, you. Y'all hear that? Give me one second to tend to her. Come here. Um, but you want to be in nature taking, taking in as much energy as you possibly can. Go for a walk by the ocean. Go for a walk in the woods, you know, just like for me, it's walking along the Mississippi River, stuff like that. I would go and I still do. Even even though we've moved on from earth to air, I've started walking. along. I still walk along the Mississippi River every day. Y'all are talking about drain gang. I have no idea what that is. Um. 
but that's the thing. Um, take on, take up an exercise regime. For me, it helps. Like one of the things I like, I, I, I well, like I like martial arts. I like weightlifting. I like things that allow me to see that I'm actually making progress, you know, not just doing the same thing over and over every day, but that I'm actually making progress. Like when you're lifting weights, I can see I'm lifting a little more this week than I was last week. Whenever I'm doing martial arts, I'm like, okay, I can do, you know, something more. She's just wallowing on the, I'm sorry, guys. She's just wallowing on the floor, floor, uh, making a ruckus. Hopefully y'all can hear me over her. Um, if she'll come over here where I can get her, I'll show you. Uh, what was the other thing? Getting close to nature. I think those are the main three things. If you can incorporate those three things into your life, you know, getting off the internet, going for walks in nature, changing your diet to the best of your ability, and taking up some sort of physical exercise routine that's going to go a long way towards helping you integrate earth energy into your life. Another thing that you can do, this is a little harder than the other three because sometimes it relies on a lot of things that you don't have any control over, but getting your finances in order. Look at your fine. Oh, raising plants. Yes, exactly. Uh, Angie says raising plants. That was another thing that we brought up to help them understand earth to actually witness it in action was choose a plant that they're going to nurture, charge with energy and grow during the course of the earthwork. And that will eventually probably end up using for some sort of uh, alchemical work in the future. Like Derek, I think Derek's going to come up with something for that. Um, and, and I did, I did this. I didn't choose one plant. I chose several. I, I chose basil because it corresponds with Mars I chose, uh, Alicia says red roses. That's excellent because red roses correspond to Venus. For Venus, I chose tomatoes. I chose a tomato plant. Um, <laughs> Spiritual Pass says, I think the cat trying to tell us something. She's trying to tell us a whole lot of something. She is, I call her the social mammal because she talks a lot. Come here, let him see you. Come here, I know. Come here. Come here. Come here. Let him see your little face. Come here. Yes, my love. Come here. Let him see you. Yes. This is Opie. This is who you hear making the noise. And you can see she only has three legs. One of her little legs is gone. She has no back leg over here. But she is my recent adoptee. Yeah. Yes. That's who's making all the noise. Um, but I started doing the, the same thing. I started raising my own, uh, plants. I chose tomatoes for Venus, rosemary for the sun, basil for Mars, lavender for Mercury. Those were the four that I started off with. Um, yeah, she is a little tiger. Yeah, but those were the main things that we we chose for Earth because if you do those things, it's going to integrate working with Earth into your life in a practical way so that you're not just cosplaying at magic. What's the other word for that stuff? Cosplaying and something else. You know what I mean, where you're just kind of pretending to do magic. This, these are ways that will actually help you begin to understand Earth. That's the next step of the process. LARPing, that's it. Yes, y'all know it. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So that's the next step of the process. You would start working with Earth every single day for at least three months doing not just the invocations of doing the earth invoking pentagram, but also doing things like what we're describing to allow you to actively change uh, your connection to the element of earth. She's still at it. No. 
Um, all right. I'm going to shut up and get off of here so I can let her out of the room. She is. <laughs> Fox Bat says my dog is reacting to your cat meow. She wants out of the room and I've got the door closed. Yes, you come here. You come here, little madam. So I'm going to get off of here for tonight so I can let her out of here. Um, but I will talk to y'all in a couple of days or so, and we'll pick up where we left off. Sorry, this is cutting a little short. I planned on going for an hour and a half tonight. So I apologize for that. But Kitty's needs take precedence. Yeah. Okay, guys. Thank y'all. And I just want to say also again, thank y'all for being with me for another month. You know, I, I truly appreciate this, and, and I very much do uh, love coming on here every night and seeing the same names, you know, like seeing y'all with me, talking about this stuff night after night. I truly appreciate that, and, it, you know, it's it's my, um, this is this is my social time. Sometimes we get a little more information out there. Sometimes it's just random stories. Sometimes there's a cat screaming in the background. Uh But thank you for bearing with me and thank you for being with me. Thank you for supporting me. All of that stuff. I appreciate y'all. We'll pick up where we left off whenever we come back. Um, but that's that would be the next stage of the work. That would be the lesson 10. After you spend at least three months doing the neophyte battery rituals, then you would start doing the earth invoking every single day, as well as incorporating all of these activities into your life in order to help you integrate earth into your spirit sensation. And whenever we come back, the next things we're going to be covering are, uh, well, the, the next thing we'll start on is the greater hexagram ritual. I won't belabor, you know, going through each of the elements yet. I'll, I'm just trying to get everything as compressed into these, um, these lessons as I possibly can. You know, I, I, I foresee this as being like maybe 20 lessons, like, like high magic lesson one, starting with like a few weeks ago, all the way to high magic lesson 20. And in that time we should have every, so any new people that comes on, we'll be able to just go back and watch those videos and have all of the basic questions answered, know all the basic rituals, the path of the work, all of that kind of stuff. Okay, guys, I'm going to shut up now. Um, I love y'all. Thank you. And we'll be back in a couple of days. Mwah.